You're listening to the Reversing Climate Change podcast by the team at Nori, the carbon removal marketplace. This is a show about the innovators and entrepreneurs developing solutions to climate change. Hello and welcome to the Reversing Climate Change podcast with Nori. I'm Ross Kenyon. I'm the creative editor at Nori, one of the co-founders there. Nori is a carbon removal marketplace based in Seattle. And today I have the pleasure of having Sandor Alex Katz with me, author of many books such as The Art of Fermentation, and as Michael Pollan has referred to you, The Johnny Appleseed of Fermentation. Welcome to the show, Sandor. Thanks so much for having me on. Pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to be with you too. I have spent so much time in your brain through your books. I've learned a lot. You've inspired me to ferment quite a lot of things. Sometimes it's taken over my life. I actually like that you have quite a lot of uh, anecdotes about how sometimes you've overdone it and then your your kitchen, your life has been ruled by microorganisms. Have you reined that in at this point or have you just given into it? Well, you know, at this point, you know, fermentation has been such a a constant for half of my life now that, you know, I mean, it's, it's very unusual that I feel overwhelmed by it. You know, I just, it's, it's, it's a constant and there's, there's certain, you know, sort of periods when I've been spending more time at home, when I sort of start more projects or do more experimentation. There's other times when I'm really busy and I'm like in and out and traveling a lot where, you you know, just by necessity, it's pared down. But, you know, I wouldn't say that I've like had any times in, in, uh, you know, recent times where I've felt, you know, overwhelmed by my ferments. You know, I, I've, I've found like a very, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, um, happy balance of, uh, of, of, of having them, maintaining them in my life. Actually, my computer that I'm talking to you through is sitting on top of a, a crock of soy sauce that's been fermenting for a year. And I keep it right on my kitchen counter because I try to stir it every day. And, you know, when I'm out of town, I have a little sign that I put up next to it to remind the people I live with or the people house sitting for us to stir it every day. You know, so so certain of the things require, you know, really kind of ongoing interaction, but most of them I can forget about for long periods of time, really. Nice to hear that you have that because for me, I used to do kombucha primarily and I felt I would produce so much of it and it wasn't good enough that I would want to drink all of it, but I felt pressure not to waste it. And then as soon as one batch was done, I wanted to get the scoby going in another one. And at some point I was producing way more than I could even give away. Um, well, you know, vinegar is a great solution for too much. But I just would have had so much vinegar then. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do with all the vinegar? And then what well, everybody vinegar? needs vinegar. You know, you could clean your windows with vinegar. You know, you can like make salad dressing with vinegar. You can marinate things in vinegar. Nobody has too much vinegar. I think releasing myself from the expectation of getting to 100% efficiency where there is always something fermenting because much of it takes a while. So there's always a pressure, like the sooner you get it in, the faster it starts working. I'm sure you you feel that in your soul driving you a little bit too. But once I gave up on that, I, I've been doing more pickles and sauerkrauts, which I feel in smaller batches are much easier to consume pretty quickly and are a family favorite, especially pickles. Pickles I find to be, there's pressure to eat them, but it's a much easier ask than drinking a gallon of kombucha. Yeah, no, I'm 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 with you. I mean, I you know, I mean, I I, I love kombucha. I enjoy kombucha once in a while. It kombucha is no longer in my like regular repertoire. Of, oh, interesting. Um, you know, of, of of things that I'm making in my kitchen. I mean, you know, I'm I'm just trying to stay away from sugary drinks and and you know, for all the other things that kombucha is kombucha is still a sugary drink and you know there's just so many ferments and you know i I mean my gateway into fermentation my most sort of constant fermented companion has definitely been fermenting vegetables and you know it grew out of my gardening practice and as, as a practical way to you know preserve abundance from certain moments in the garden but i think it's a it's you know it's a really it's a great thing that people in a small household can do on a very small scale like you don't need to make your sauerkraut in a 55 gallon barrel. You know, you don't need to preserve a year's worth at a time, you know, even if this is the way your great great grandparents were doing it, just because our context at the moment is, uh, is, 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 is different. And I think that, you know, it's a real skill, really with anything in the kitchen, but particularly with fermentation, just to scale it appropriately for your household. Are there reasons that you consider important to ferment for beyond just, 
I don't know. Uh, why why should someone even bother with this? Because it seems stinky. There's a, a lot of food prep. There's stuff that's being stored places that takes up space. Why not just buy everything? I mean, lots of people are making artisanal fermented products. Is it not better just to buy those? Well, I mean, I don't think it's I don't think it's better, and and really, I don't think it's worse. I mean, you know, I'm mm. I'm I'm really not on a mission to convince everybody that like they have to get interested in fermentation and start fermenting. You, you know, really, what I would say is a little bit of a of of an inverse to that. Like, if anyone has you know the slightest interest or inkling to ferment, there's no reason for them to be afraid. There's no reason for them to be intimidated. And you know, really, the you know the thrust of my work is trying to demystify fermentation, you know, sort of to empower people who are interested in doing it to do it. I'm I'm not out to convince everybody that they have to start fermenting in their own kitchen. But I do think that there are a lot of great advantages. And, you know, if we think about fermentation broadly, like there are always practical benefits to fermentation. You know, your food is not decomposing into a disgusting, ugly mess that nobody would ever put into their mouths. And instead, you know, either you are preserving abundance from, you know, one moment of the year to enjoy through other times. You might be making food more digestible. You might simply be making food more delicious. You might be producing alcohol. But, you know, there's always practical benefits to fermentation. And it's also making food safer. I mean, fermentation. Fermentation above all else is a strategy for for food safety. Now, in terms of like, you know, why bother doing it yourself? I mean, for one, it's super fun and satisfying. And for another thing, you know, if we want to think about it in terms of, you know, microbial terroir. And, you know, at this point, we understand that, you know, every healthy human being is host to trillions of bacteria. And those bacteria play a huge role in, you know, our physiological functioning. And, you know, they enable us to effectively digest food. They synthesize essential nutrients inside of our bodies. They constitute uh, much of what we describe as our immune systems. They, you know, play a role in all kinds of biochemical regulation, including serotonin and other compounds that determine how we feel and how we think. And so, you know, I, I guess I would I would encapsulate the, the relationship of fermentation to this is it has the potential to, you know, restore and improve biodiversity in the gut, which can potentially improve any of those things. And I think, you know, anyone can potentially benefit from incorporating fermented foods into their diet. But what's particular about, you know, fermenting foods in your kitchen, fermenting the foods that you grew in your yard, fermenting foods that, uh, you know, farmers in your area have grown is that the microbial communities on the locally grown foods they are your environment. And when you ferment at home with, you know, foods that come from nearby and, and then you eat those foods, you are quite literally becoming your environment. And I think it's, a, you know, an excellent strategy for, you know, not, you know, buying some generic, you know, probiotic bacteria, you know, at the nutritional supplement uh, uh, shop, but rather, you know, sort of incorporating what's, you know, sort of right around you into your diet. And I think that that can be very uh, uh, powerful. Now, beyond that, you know, there's an economic aspect to it too. I mean, there are excellent local and regional uh, brands of fermented vegetables. Uh, you know, I have friends six miles away who, you know, make wonderful sauerkraut and kimchi, you know, but I am constantly hearing people complaining about how much that costs. And so, you know, they're outraged that like, you know, a, a pint sized jar of fermented vegetables is going to, you know, cost them $10. And, you know, it's really like, it's very easy. You can do it yourself. You could go buy, you know, a, a pint sized jar will take about a pound of vegetables. You can buy a pound of, of, of vegetables for, you know, depending on what the vegetable in the season is, you know, anywhere from, you know, maybe 50 cents to a couple of dollars. You can shred those vegetables. You can put a couple of cents worth of salt on them. You can pound them and squeeze them a little bit to get them juicy. You can pack them into a jar that you have already in your kitchen from some other commercial food that you bought and you can ferment it in that. And so for, you know, for less than a dollar up to a couple of dollars, you know, you can make that pint of, of fermented vegetables yourself. So, you know, like many things you could do yourself, it preserves resources and um, saves you money. 
I think it's quite empowering too to not merely be a consumer, but be involved in food production, especially as our civilization has become much more urbanized, much less connected to the land and making things. And many people work from computers and are not actually making anything tangible. The idea of participating in your own food system, I find to be really rewarding. It's a little scary at first too, because there is a concern, like, am I going to poison myself? But I think you try so hard in your books to say, there's not actually a lot of documented cases of this. It's pretty safe. Like, do not worry. But I think people, if they they get their hands dirty in that, you know, get some gochuchang on your hands, it feels good. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I I am so with you on that. And I, you know, I think that, uh, you know, a a significant piece of the environmental destructiveness of our society has to do with, you, you know, how, you know, little most of us have to do with, you know, in terms of direct interaction with our environment. And, you know, all food production is about interacting with plants and with animals and with microorganisms. And I think that the vast majority of us have, you know, supposedly been liberated from that toil. But at the same time, it's created this profound sense of disconnection and alienation. And I agree wholeheartedly that, you know, you know, any kind of getting involved Involved in food production, whether it's you know growing some herbs in your windows, whether it's having a small garden, whether it's getting involved in a community garden, whether it's supporting local farmers by buying food at a farmer's market, whether it's you know fermenting vegetables or or other things in your home, can you know really really be profound in terms of you know helping to make us you know more connected to our environment. And then in terms of in terms of the safety, I mean, I just want to say like food does not get safer than fermented vegetables. And statistically speaking, fermented vegetables are much, much, much safer than raw vegetables because, you know, e- you know, we read every year about outbreaks of food poisoning stemming from yeah. raw vegetables. You know, uh, last year it was r- red onions. Uh, My uncle know, got sick from tomatoes. blueberries one year. Yeah. But, you know, clearly there's the possibility of an incidental contamination of raw produce. But if you ferment it, well, you know, the lactic acid bacteria that are present on all plants growing out of soil on planet Earth, you know, once you get the vegetable submerged in the way that you that, that you do it, the lactic acid bacteria will dominate every time. And if there happen to be some cells of E. coli, salmonella, other organisms that have the potential to make us sick, the very convenient fact for us is that the pathogens cannot survive in an acidic environment. And so acidifying vegetables just is about as safe as food gets. That's a nice PSA for the listeners. One thing I catch both in the way that you speak, but also you're a little bit more explicit about it in fermentation as metaphor, uh, something I associate with Ed Young and, and Lynn Margulis that we sort of are larger, the anthropology that we've assumed to be the case that we are individual, that we are a coherent being has been challenged by the fact that there are trillions of microorganisms that complete metabolic processes for us, including ones that are cognitive in origin too, and that we're actually bigger than just this individual self that's been named. And within fermentation as a metaphor, you have a sort of queer politics operating that's about uh, fermentation as a way of understanding the dissolution of boundaries in, in some important way. Am I Help fill in the gaps here. Am I am I on to something? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that I, I I think that this is you know a profound shift that is taking place in how we we view ourselves, and you know I think that there there is this sort of long tradition of thinking of you know the individual human being as this you know sort of singular unit. And I think that, you know, sort of science is showing us more and more the degree to which we are really these composite beings and that, you know, you you know, we, we, we have these trillions of microorganisms that we are host to, but they're not random and they're not parasitic and they're not freeloading. They exist in a symbiotic relationship with us. And, you know, we could not possibly live without them. And I think that we're also learning that, you know, sort of many of the, you know, sort of emergent, you know, sort of epidemic health problems have something to do with diminished biodiversity you know, in our bodies and that we really need this biodiversity. And so, you know, each human being is not a singular entity, but we are these sort of, you know, massive, you know, microbial universes. 
And, you know, I don't want to take away anybody's sort of agency or anybody's, you know, individual identity. But, you know, what we can do and who we are is actually extremely complex and involves the collaboration of all these different kinds of organisms. What would really change if you saw yourself more as a shepherd of the microbiome rather than uh, an independent brain that operates unilaterally? Does that much really change spiritually, uh, practically? Does anything really change? I mean, sure, sure. I mean, just yeah. just in terms of our outlook and how how we think about things and mm-hmm. and you know how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive our relationship to what is beyond us. <laughs> So, I, I mean, sure. I mean, I imagine that there are people who, you know, in their their conception could sort of minimize the the importance of that. You know, I think that the growing recognition of that is really is shifting a lot. Like, I, you know, I, I, I learned this new word recently, which is lichenization. And, you know, sort of science has long recognized that lichens are, you know, not a singular life form, but 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 that every lichen is a, is a symbiosis. But we're realizing that that's true of pretty much every life form, that no life form is singular. And I think that that, you know, really, I don't know, calls into question a lot of, you know, our our thinking and our ideas. And I think it really sort of strengthens the importance of, you know, interdependence. Has your learning about fermentation, in addition to I mean, your life story is quite fascinating as well. Has that influenced the spiritual dimensions of how you approach your work? Is that even a thing for you? Do you do you have any sort of divine interest or is that extraneous? Well, I mean, I have I have been accused of being a spiritual couch potato. Um, <laughs> who, who called you that? That seems that seems like a rude thing to call you. <laughs> A friend of mine, <laughs> uh, long ago. But yeah, sure. I mean, I think that you know, for me, you know, my practice of fermentation has really helped me to to tune into unseen forces in our lives. And I think you know, fermentation has always been regarded as you know a mystical phenomenon. And, um, you know, I mean, fermentation is really very ancient. I mean, certainly, I mean, the way biologists talk about fermentation as anaerobic metabolism, the production of energy without oxygen, cells of our bodies are capable of fermentation. The earliest forms of life on earth were fermenting organisms. And, you know, as the symbiosis between different early organisms resulted in more complex cell structures, what what are called eukaryotic cells, which is what all of the multicellular life forms are composed of, you, you know, the multicellular life forms that, that they spawned have all had bacteria and other single cell organisms as part of them. So, you know, like as mitochondria, right? That's where that comes from. Mitochondria, cell nuclei. But yeah, I mean, sort of one of the things that distinguishes the earliest cells, the prokaryotic cells from the eukaryotic cells is that in the early cells, the genetic material is not contained in a nucleus. And actually that gives them this incredible genetic flexibility, which multicellular organisms do not possess because the cell, the the, the genetic material is in a nucleus and pretty much fixed for the life of the organism. Species are also is maybe the incorrect paradigm for understanding much of the microbiota at this point too, right? Like that is also becoming, the boundaries are much fuzzier than we once thought. Sure, sure, sure. No, I mean, especially for, you know, for bacteria, which have this incredible shape-shifting ability, this genetic flexibility, this ability to, you know, take in and release and exchange genetic material. I mean, many microbiologists really are coming to the conclusion that, you know, our concept of species, which we developed to describe animals and plants, you know, really is an inappropriate way to describe bacteria because there's so much genetic flexibility and shape shifting among them. Now, you know, I'm I'm certainly not trained as a microbiologist. I I am not in a position to sort of have a, you know, a nuanced view of this debate, but I, you know, I'm I am well aware that that, you know, this is a, a debate in the field of microbiology is, you know, just how appropriate is this conception that we have of species to bacteria. So much of human knowledge is 
based around having stable categories. And I, I wonder what happens when we lose the ability to speciate in a meaningful way. How does one even practice science with so many confounding, interacting variables where you don't have stable categories? It kind of hurts my brain to think about what might emerge next. How does one even do that? Science is never fixed. You know, we're, we're, we're always like learning more that's sort of changing our conception of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think we, we have no choice but to, you know, sort of be open to the, you know, new information we have and, you know, consider that our, you know, earlier conceptions of, you know, how things are organized were imperfect. And, you know, we need to, you know, use our observational skills. I remember where I was going earlier, okay. you know, I was because, you know, really I, I got into how I was talking about how ancient fermentation is. Oh, that's right. And that in a certain sense, it goes back to the earliest life on earth in terms of a human cultural practice of fermentation. There's an archaeological record that demonstrates that the practice of fermentation is at least 10,000 years old from pottery shards in, in China. But really, I, I mean, I would say that, that that only tells us about the history of pottery, not about the history of fermentation, because presumably the earliest vessels that people used for fermentation were all things that are totally biodegradable from various animal membranes to wood, hollowed out wooden structures, gourds. But, you know, any of the earliest kinds of vessels would biodegrade. But we do have pottery showing us that, that there's an intentional human practice of fermentation going back at least 10,000 years and fermentation is practiced everywhere. And, you know, my, you know, my general idea about why is fermentation practiced everywhere is, you know, the, the, I mean, the simple fact that microbiology is illuminated for us that, you know, all of the plants and all of the animals and all of the animal products that make up our food are populated by microorganisms. So there's a certain inevitability to microbial transformation. And, you know, without specifically knowing about bacteria, because, you know, science really only began to have a firm idea about bacteria about 150 years ago, without even knowing about bacteria, people developed, you know, incredibly elaborate range of techniques for working with them. And the way that I, you know, envision it is that, you know, just as a practical matter, people observed under what conditions does food decompose into a disgusting, ugly mess that nobody would ever put into their mouths. And under what contrasting conditions does the food improve in some kind of a tangible way and wh whether it's you know becoming more delicious becoming more easily digestible becoming more stable for a uh, 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 storage and you know in this question of storage i think is really you know i think it's relevant and and not unrelated to the topic of your podcast and and you know and that is you know, for people living in the 21st century, you know, particularly in the more affluent parts of the world, we have a refrigerator. And so people are used to preserving food in the refrigerator or in the freezer, or we have these, uh, you know, techniques which are really relatively recent in the scheme of things like, you know, using heat and pressure to, you know, um, preserve things in a sterile way in a jar that, you know, that we call canning. Uh, uh, in English and French, they call it apertization because they remember the name of Nicolas Apert, the clever Frenchman who early in the 19th century discovered this, this, this process. But our refrigerators, I mean, you know, I keep a lot of things in the refrigerator. I, I mean, I keep the yogurt that I make in the refrigerator because I have the refrigerator. But, you know, I mean, the fresh milk that we grew up with, like it was something that only people living on dairy farms ever had access to before the 20th century. And, you know, it became the popular way to consume milk because of refrigeration, because it was possible. But, you know, in all of the parts of the world where there's a tradition of, of people raising animals for their milk, you know, there are fermented forms of milk and whether that's yogurt or kefir or cheese, you know, these all are practical strategies for preserving milk. And now like, you know, a hard cheese, like a Parmesan cheese or a cheddar cheese, I mean, really a big block of that is stable for years, you know, outside of refrigeration. I mean, with yogurt, it might not be years, it might be weeks, 
If you don't keep it in the refrigerator, the bacteria will continue to make it more sour. So the flavor will become more intensely sour as the days and weeks go on. But, you know, that sourness only makes it safer because, you know, the pathogens can't survive in an acidic environment. So, you know, I, I think it's really hard for people in our time to even conceptualize how they would feed themselves without this, you know, sort of energy guzzling machine. But, you know, obviously people do and people did. And, you know, most people on planet Earth do not have a refrigerator in 2023. And, um, um, you know, and we still have an incredible amount of wisdom, you know, of, of, you know, cultural legacies from every part of the world and how to feed ourselves, how to preserve food, you know, without the benefit of this machine. And I'm, I'm not encouraging people to throw away their 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 refrigerators. But, you know, it, it's certainly conceivable that, you know, there will be a moment when, you know, energy will not be as as widely available, will not be as cheap as it is now, and that refrigerators will not be so widespread and it it really behooves us to hold on to this cultural wisdom. I wonder how our health would change as a species if we were less reliant upon refrigeration and other preservation techniques and were more reliant upon fermentation. Surely, surely it'd be a healthier human community. Yeah, there's so many potential health benefits to fermented foods. And I and I don't want to say that fermented foods are superior to fresh foods. I mean, I, I like I do not espouse that belief at all. I mean, like, you know, really, I think that there's nothing, you know, there's nothing better and more luscious and more satisfying than, you know, really fresh food. But, you know, the reality is in most places, you know, we just cannot feed ourselves through the year day in, day out with fresh food. To some degree, we have to be reliant on different preservation methods. And, you know, I mean, fermentation is not the only ancient preservation method. I mean, drying food, you know, certain kinds of foods, you know, in their mature state, they're dried you know, any kind of grain, any kind of bean, any kind of nut. And so, you know, to preserve these foods, we don't need a refrigerator and we don't necessarily need to ferment them. And when people ferment them, they're like nobody ever ferments a bean or a grain in order to preserve it. People ferment beans and grains in order to unlock their nutritive potential. They ferment them in order to make them more delicious. They ferment them in in order to make them lighter. I mean, think about bread. You know, if bread wasn't fermented, it would be dense like a brick. And what gives bread its sort of its lightness and its, um, you know, pleasant texture is is the lifting. It's, you know, the bubbles of carbon dioxide that that form inside the loaf and, and lift it up. You know, also a lot of these sort of dense foods like a soybean or a grain of wheat, like they can preserve for very long periods of time as long as you keep them dry. But their density and some of the protective, you know, what I would call anti-nutrient compounds that they have in order to, you know, discourage critters from eating them so that they can, you know, potentially fulfill their evolutionary destiny of germinating and, and reproducing. But you know, they can be very difficult for us to digest. And so, you know, the fermentation breaks down a lot of these anti-nutrient compounds. And, you know, in the case of soybeans, which are the plant source food with the most protein, our human bodies, you know, can't break it down to absorb that protein. So the Asian cultures that developed soy agriculture thousands of years ago recognized the indigestibility of the soybeans. If you try to eat just a bowl of cooked soybeans for dinner, you're going to have terrible indigestion digestion and gas, and you're not going to get very much protein out of them. And so, you know, all of these different traditions emerged of fermenting the soybeans in different ways. And the the fermentation doesn't preserve them, but it pre-digests them. It breaks down the proteins into amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. And this, you know, not only makes the nutrients more accessible, but it makes them flavorful. And it takes an otherwise, you know, very mild somewhat insipid food and gives it like, you know, all of this incredible character and flavor. We've also danced a little bit around this and you haven't addressed it directly, but I've also seen the beer first theory of civilization that actually (laughs) settlement in a permanent capacity. I think in Egypt is where this is supposed to have happened. People settled in order to produce beer, (laughs) like regular supplies of beer 
So like, there's also that side of fermentation too. Is that responsible for us having permanent settled civilizations? Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is certainly a debate, you know, within the field of archaeology. But I mean, I think it's pretty clear that like sort of, you know, civilizations emerged out of grain agriculture. And the Chinese civilization emerged around rice agriculture. And in um, uh, the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East, it was around uh, uh, wheat agriculture. And in the Americas, it was around corn agriculture. And in Africa, it, it was it, it was around um, a, a millet agriculture. So, you know, different grains in different places. But, you know, the significance of grains is this thing that I mentioned, that they are so stable and storable. And so, you know, sort of this gave rise to the idea of like growing lots and storing it. And it also, you know, gave rise to, you know, the idea of accumulations of wealth and, you know, sort of rulers being able to rule large numbers of people. But then then there's a question of, well, what did people do with these grains? And, you know, bread, which is, um, you know, almost synonymous with sustenance in a in a in a, in a Western context. You know, is 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 one explanation. But then, you know, beer is another thing you can do with it. But you know, what I would say is that you know, in all of the parts of the world where civilizations grew out of grain agriculture, the grains were used both for alcoholic beverages and for food. So to me, it's a you know it's 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 a little bit of an academic debate. However, if people in their earlier you know migratory patterns were reasonably well fed, it does seem to me that a more compelling reason to change your way of life is you know because of this you know sort of you know mind altering alcoholic beverages that that you could now produce more so than bread. But I think that there, there's definitely room for debate about this question, and there has been plenty of it. Oh, certainly. It's a fun one to think about. One thing I've noticed in your writing and speaking to you now is that you are quite passionate about fermentation and fermented foods, but you're also a rather humble evangelist as well. I feel like you often carve out space for saying like, well, you can buy things store-bought, or you also tell stories in your books about how people will assume that you're a raw vegan, or like you have other sorts of very strong food preferences that there's something about food that makes us focus on, on purity and exclusion mm. in a really powerful way. I don't know what it is about food politics that are so intense, but there's something you, I think you identify it almost as fascistic in a way of a, a politics of purity around food. What, what happens with our brains and food? It, it really drives us nutty. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I don't know. You know, I, I, I really, just try not to be dogmatic about food. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not dogmatic about diet. I mean, I definitely have ideas and preferences, but, you know, I also see that people around the world eat in a lot of different ways. And, and so, you know, if you like, okay, plant-based diet, I mean, you know, I love vegetables. I mean, I, I love to eat vegetables. I crave vegetables. It doesn't mean that I don't eat meat. Um, you know, I like, I've actually, I helped a friend of mine raise a couple of pigs and I ended up with all of this fat and I like, I've been using lard, but like, oh my God, a spoonful of lard in, uh, you know, sauteing vegetables, just like, you know, just adds incredible flavor to it. And I, I think sometimes, you know, we talk about, we talk about diet it isn't like, you know, either every day you have to eat like, or every meal, you have to eat a giant slab of meat or you're vegan. And the thing is, in most cultural contexts, people have used meat in relatively small amounts to, you know, enhance their primarily plant-based diets. But not everywhere. I mean, I've become friendly with this woman who is a microbiologist from Greenland. And, you know, the Greenland diet has, you know, virtually no, or the traditional Greenland diet has, you know, virtually no plant food, but eating the organs of animals, uh, of, of, of fish and marine mammals and animals is considered essential, including, you know, the contents of the intestine, which is generally digested plants. So, you know, I mean, I, mean, I think that, you know, it's terrible for us to sort of like 
have these sort of abstracted ideas of how everybody needs to eat when clearly there are examples of populations where just based on, you know, the the foods that are abundant in their environment, they have sort of worked out strategies for survival in very different ways. And I think, you know, what's clear for me as someone who's, you know, just been interested in how people in different places eat is that human beings are extremely versatile and we can survive and we can thrive on very different kinds of diets. And, and it always strikes me as absurd when people are promoting like a, a singular kind of a diet that's like the only way to be healthy. And I think that there's a lot of different ways we can be healthy and a lot of different examples of, of how people eat. And I think, you know, ultimately a lot of it comes down to, you know, balance and how we sort of, you know, balance out the different foods that we eat, you know, and I, I think that, you know, people sometimes project also like magical powers on foods. Like, I, like actually, I just was talking to, I was just talking to a friend of mine, like what a triggering thing it is for me when people talk about superfoods, you know, they, there's a, you know, this berry from, you know, this far away part of the world. And, you know, if we could just eat this berry every day, then, you know, it'll solve all of our problems. And I just think that's just completely, you know, unrealistic. And I think the whole idea of superfoods is just like a marketing ploy, you know, and that's not to say that there aren't like nutritionally powerful kinds of foods, but in every environment, Environment, there are nutritionally powerful kinds of foods. And of course, you know, a singular food, I mean, including sauerkraut, I mean, sauerkraut is an incredible food. Like I love to eat sauerkraut, but, you know, to say that like, oh, if you eat sauerkraut every day, all your problems are going to go away is just completely unrealistic because thinking that one food is going to change everything in the context of everything else you do, you know, it's, it's like, okay, well, what else are you eating along with the sauerkraut? And never mind what you're eating, you know, what are you doing? How active are you being? How, you know, content contented and happy are you? How good is the sleep that you're getting? I mean, you know, our health is just an outcome of all of these different factors. And to think that like one singular factor is going to be like the determining factor. I mean, I think it's very reductionistic. And I think that, you know, a lot of the dietary movements that we see are, you know, just imagining if, if only you could get the food right you know, everything else would follow. And I mean, diet is important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not discounting the importance of, of what we eat, but I just don't think that there are singular reductionistic answers. And yeah, sure. I mean, a lot of dietary movements can be very, very puritanical. You know, for me personally, that just puts me off. And, uh, you know, I have, I have these friends who, you know, follow this intense, like raw food diet. And I mean, they really believe that like sort of human culture all around the world made a critical error thousands of years ago in applying fire to food. That sort of all human cultural traditions are wrong. And then, you know, sort of somehow, you know, their all raw dietary movement got it right. And I, you know, I just, I mean, you know, these are friends of mine. I like them. It doesn't mean I agree with everything they say, but I have just huge respect for human cultural traditions. That's really, you know, my obsession with fermentation is really sort of ultimately an interest in, you know, in, in, in these human cultural traditions of, 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 of how we use food and, and all those sort of diverse approaches to it. And, you know, if we're going to say human cultural traditions are, are, are all like wrong, then, you know, we might as well say like language is all wrong. <laughs> but people do say that like John Zerzan is like, we got to go back to primitivism, go back to pre-symbolic language. There are people out there saying that. Okay, well, I, I beg to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Well, okay, we don't want to be reductionistic here, but maybe one reduction you might permit is that when you do ferment something and it's homemade, you have uh, a polyculture of many, many different types of uh, microorganisms where if you buy something commercially fermented, it might be a single strain of FDA-approved probiotic added that is not uh, indigenous to to the substrate that it's going into necessarily. Like the diversity is the important thing that homemade fermenting might foster where commercial fermenting might neglect. So in some ways they might even be too different and we might be able to reduce to say homemade is often better than commercially bought. Is, would you allow that? 
Sure. But I mean, I would say like, OK, like, well, you know, one of the things that I that I make regularly is yogurt. And the first years that I was making yogurt, you know, I would go to the store, I'd buy a little like, you know, the smallest container of, you know, plain whole milk yogurt. And I'd use that as a starter. And my first batch, as long as I got the temperature manipulation part right, my first batch would always be beautiful and thick and luscious. And then if I use that as a starter for a next batch, it was never quite as good the second time. And by the third generation, it always just was gone. I mean, it was homemade, but I was starting from a commercial culture. And, you know, it turns out that, you know, the early microbiologists were terrified of biodiversity and the biodiversity of a lot of traditional fermented foods. And that, you know, your traditional yogurts had these sort of wide variety of bacteria in them. And the early microbiologists set out to identify which ones were absolutely functionally necessary to make yogurt. And they basically isolated out two organisms out of this big mass of unknown organisms. And, you know, all commercial yogurt is based on those two uh, single strains of organisms that make beautiful yogurt, but they're not really able to sustain themselves generation after generation because they lack an evolved structure with essentially defense mechanisms. Whereas the traditional yogurts, which are these evolved communities, have structures to maintain themselves generation after generation. So, you know, eventually I got a hold of what I would describe as an heirloom yogurt culture. You know, this one's originally from Romania via, you know, New York and the UK, and then back to where I live in Tennessee. But, you know, a lot of people, I mean, you know, you could make, there's people selling little white powder to make sauerkraut. You know, there's people making homemade sauerkraut who like think that they need this little white powder. So, you know, for me, the defining characteristic isn't necessarily simply, is it homemade, but it's like, how, how are you making it? You know, there's people making cheeses at home that are added, adding pure culture starters. And by the way, I mean, I'm not against the use of pure culture starters. I mean, I think that, you know, in certain applications, they can be extremely practical, but, you know, they're a phenomenon of the 20th century. And, you know, all fermentation until the 20th century was, you know, relying either on wild fermentation or what I would describe as backslopping, which is when you take a batch, a scoop of the previous yogurt and introduce it into the new yogurt. It's maintain your sourdough starter by taking a little scoop of the sourdough and adding it to fresh flour and water. So, you know, there, there are, you know, ancient means of, of perpetuating situation beyond wild fermentation. Wild fermentation is, well, it's the name of my, my first book about fermentation, but it's also throughout the literature used to describe, you know, any kind of fermentation based on the organisms that are present on that food or to a limited degree in the environment. So, um, you know, to me, that was the, the more important distinction. And, you know, there are people producing various kinds of ferments on a commercial scale using wild fermentation. And then there's some people making things at home using pure culture starters. You know, if you compare something like the Georgian winemaking traditions or natural winemaking generally, or wild fermentation of beer, the variability by vintage, I think is quite high relative to a commercial yeast, which sometimes there's magic in a bottle. Like, there's nothing else like it when it's good. And there's also some where you're like, this whole case is bad and needs to be thrown in the garbage, essentially. Well, I think that that's one of the reasons why people find why, you know, especially in the context of large scale production, people find pure culture starters to be so helpful because there definitely is is more variability in wild fermentation. But I would say in every realm of fermentation, whether we're going to talk about, you know, wines or cheeses or breads or salamis or sauerkrauts, in every realm of fermentation, the, you know, the most delicious examples you can find in the world, the, you know, the greatest practitioners are, are always working with, with wild fermentation. But as you say, there's greater variability and there's more potential for problems. And, you know, really, really the reason why Louis Pasteur was highly 
hired by, you know, a winemaker to start investigating fermentation had to do with the industrial revolution and scaling up. And, and if, you know, winemakers from, you know, the earliest practitioners thousands of years ago, you know, had this incredible variability, well, you know, in the industrial revolution, as people were scaling up, that variability made the stakes higher. And so, you know, the pure culture starters made it all predict more, much more predictable and much more consistent. And, you know, and that, that has its benefit, but, you know, it's still amazing to taste the, you know, the, the incredible complex flavors, uh, you know, of a wonderful raw milk cheese or, you know, just incredible flavor of, of a delicious sourdough loaf of bread or, you know, some of the styles of beer that are relying on wild fermentation. And, you know, I think that, you know, generally the most outstanding examples are made by wild fermentation. I respect that. You acknowledge trade-offs so strongly. It's it's sadly not as common as one might think. Why aren't you more of a partisan or ideologue? I, I think someone might have expected that of you. Why do you shirk this duty? Uh, <laughs> well, I mean... I use pure culture starters. I, I, you know, it's like I, I, I make tempeh and I use starters for the tempeh. And I don't know, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, fermentation like food grows out of particular places. And, you know, if you want to experiment widely and, you know, certain kinds of vegetables, I have to, you know, employ technology in order to grow them in my environment. I have to, you know, use row covers that extend the season or, 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 or something like that. And certain kinds of ferments, I just couldn't possibly make in my environment, an environment where they're not, where they're not indigenous to, you know, without some kind of technical, technological assist. So, you know, I mean, I don't think that... You know, I I guess I just can't help myself. I mean, I just see, you know, I see multiple sides of these things. And, and you know, for myself, like I haven't used a packet of yeast in, you know, more than 25 years. You know, it's not that I think the packet of yeast is evil. I just think like, well, OK, everything that the packet of yeast could ferment, you know, anything sugary, any kind of fruit, any kind of grain already has yeast on it. And so, you know, I'm just more interested in the magic of sort of like, you know, bringing the yeast that's already on these substrates to life. But, you know, I don't want to pretend that it's just, you know, some, you know, evil conspiracy that's encouraging people to use them. It's just like, I, I can appreciate ease and 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 quickness and why sort of, you know, somebody who's working too hard but still likes to make their own bread would want to use yeast and just be able to have the process be done in two or three hours and live with bread that doesn't have as much flavor complexity. If someone is listening and they haven't done any fermentation before, or at least that they know about, where do you recommend people start? Well, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll suggest my books are a good place to start. Wild Fermentation is is probably the, the most accessible introduction. The Art of Fermentation is, you know, much more thorough and in-depth. Uh, my latest book is called Fermentation Journeys, and that's about fermented foods and beverages that I've learned about in my travels in, in, in recent years. You know, I'm glad that you brought up fermentation as metaphor. That's not going to really teach you much about the practical aspects of fermentation, but if you want to think about um, um, some of the implications of fermentation and some of the ways that in the English language we use the word fermentation to describe any kind of bubbly, excited phenomenon, then check out that book. I have another book that I don't know if you even know about called The Revolution Will Not Be Microwaved Inside America's Underground Food Movements. And this is about, you know, various grassroots movements to reclaim our food. So, you know, you can you can start with my books, but there's a lot of resources out there. I mean, you, you know, you can just search on the Internet and find like lots of recipes. I have a website, wildfermentation.com, with links to all kinds of fermentation related resources uh, out there on the World Wide Web. You know, more and more you can find classes in different locales of, you know, people sharing their skills at, at, at fermentation. You, you know, the Internet's full of videos like YouTube videos you know, how to, how to make sauerkraut, how to make kimchi, how to make koji, how to make anything. So, you know, the resources are out there and, you know, just, just try to, you know, get over whatever kind of anxiety you might be projecting onto the process and give it a try. 
honestly, it's so much easier than, than you think it's the same with in, in cooking. You can often substitute time for skill. Like you could do a braise, which is mostly prep work. Or if you brine a chicken a couple of days ahead of time with, with salt and buttermilk, like you can look like a competent chef. I feel like, like fermenting is often like that too. A lot of it's prep and waiting the correct amount of time. And it's easier than you might think. I find your work to be very accessible and encouraging because it is trying to demystify it. It is something that literally anyone can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the thing is, I, I just keep on reminding myself and reminding other people that like these processes were not worked out by microbiologists in laboratories. These were worked out thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago in the kitchens of people who most likely have a much, much less technology than you have in your kitchen. And, you know, you don't need a lot of special fancy equipment. If you really get into it, I mean, you know, ceramic crocs and other specialized equipment, you know, certainly can make it easier to do large amounts of things. But, you know, for, for small amounts of fermenting vegetables, jars that you already have in your kitchen are your friend. And as you point out, it's takes time. It takes a little bit of advanced planning and certain ferments like the soy sauce that my computer is sitting on right now, you know, that might take a year or longer, but you know, most ferments really, you know, happen in the, in the course of a week or a couple of weeks, or, you know, some of them like, you know, yogurt, you know, I usually ferment my yogurt for about eight hours. Most commercial yogurt is only fermented for about two and a half hours. So, you know, the, the fermentation byproducts accumulate over time. And if you like things stronger, then you need to wait longer. But if you prefer things with milder flavors, then you can really generally enjoy them relatively quickly. Very encouraging. Well, Sandor, thanks so much for, for being here with me. It's a true pleasure to, to have you on. I've learned so much from you and, and thanks for being here. It's my pleasure. Happy to be with you. And thanks for listening. If you like what we do here, hey, please give us a great rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It really helps us a lot. It's one thing you can do to help the show. Send this to a friend. And hey, thanks again so much for spending time with us. Have a lovely day. Thank you so much for listening. If you could please subscribe and give us a great rating and review on Apple Podcasts or a rating on Spotify, that'd be much appreciated. It helps us get our content out to more people. You can sign up for our newsletter at nori.com, follow us on social media, and we will catch you next time.